did I know of these people, these Bolsheviks? Just what I'd heard, that they were monsters, devils. Their very names, Lenin, Trotsky, Kamenev, scared the British upper classes out of their wits. And yet, when Kamenev invited me, I said yes without hesitation. On the 11th of September, 1920, Claire Sheridan, a wealthy young widow turned fashionable sculptor, set steam from Newcastle in secret. Her destination was Bolshevik Russia. Three years earlier, in 1917, the Bolshevik October Revolution had sent shockwaves round the world. Lenin and his Bolsheviks had seized power in the name of the workers. The old order based on class and the ownership of property, they'd destroyed. In 1918, they'd had the Tsar and his family shot. In Britain, as elsewhere, the old order had watched in horror. Winston Churchill, the young minister for war, described Lenin as a plague virus that would infect the world. Claire Sheridan was Winston Churchill's cousin. So what had possessed her, despite her family, despite her class, to visit the very heart of this Bolshevik revolution. August 17th, 1920, London. As arranged, Kamenev arrived punctually at 10 o'clock for one hour, but ended up staying for three. There's no great challenge in his face. It's a perfect oval. But it's difficult to make him serious because he smiles all the time. Lev Kamenev, one of Lenin's closest colleagues, had come to London on a secret trade mission. But his visit was widely whispered in society. Claire had joked that to include Kamenev in her next exhibition would be a great stunt. A sitting was arranged. He wasn't at all what I'd expected. He spoke for three hours without stopping. We talked in French. He was really very friendly, very charming. I teased him about Russia, about what I'd heard. I said, I read in the Moscow canteens recently they found human fingers in the soup. Is that true? Where did you read that? In your London Times? In return, he gave me this long, passionate description of the revolution, of their aims and ideals. Did they also tell you in these canteens the working man can buy a square meal for three and a half rubles? That's when he talked politics, he got all worked up and gave the pinched, quizzical frown that I wanted. It's what we fought for. And then maybe because I'd been saying that all my life I'd loved Russian literature, Russian music, Russian dancing, Russian art, he stopped and he said, You know, you should come to Russia to see for yourself. I'll get Lenin and Trotsky to sit for you. Does that tempt you? I thought at first he was joking. But when I saw in his eyes he was serious, I replied, Just let me know when you're leaving. I'll be ready like a shot. En route to Russia, Claire learned more from Kamenev of this Bolshevik society that so appalled her friends. Rather than finding it frightening, she found it strangely inspiring. Kamenev showed her photographs of the revolution of 1917. How the peasants had shared out the land between them. How the workers had set up committees to run the factories for themselves 
women working now alongside men. As Kamenev described it, this was more than just the destruction of the old order. It was a struggle to create a more equal society where people could work not for the profit of others, but for the common good. By the time Claire arrived in Moscow, this worker's paradise was already three years old. But first impressions, to say the least, were disappointing. We were driven at full speed through streets shuttered as if after an air raid. The few people we passed looked, frankly, wretched, shuffling along, not one quick step, not one smiling face. Just the sadness of autumn and a dread of winter coming too soon. Claire moved in with the Kamenevs, sleeping on a sofa because no one had fixed her a place to stay. The clothes she'd brought were completely unsuitable. No one had mentioned how cold it would soon become. Meanwhile, the Kamenevs argued over a Macintosh Lev had failed to bring back from England. And of course, Madame Kamenev took an instant dislike to this well-dressed young foreigner. You have such pretty things. Here we have nothing. What followed were days of frustration. Kamenev was too busy to arrange the sittings he'd promised. Without him, Claire found herself drifting around the Kremlin, the center of government, until the cold drove her back indoors. September 22nd. I just wander around, opening doors. Today I stumbled into a barrack room full of Red Army soldiers playing cards. Over the Tsar's palace, crows peck at the flagstaff where the royal flag once flew. I feel, I must confess, very lost and very lonely. Bolshevik Russia set up in Claire a flood of confusing emotions. On the one hand, there were frequent glimpses of that Bolshevik spirit she found so exciting. The fact that here no one was sir or madam, everyone equal. Tavarish, comrade. She saw soldiers learning to paint in the art schools, workers visiting museums for the first time in their lives. There were campaigns for literacy to teach people to read. Universities had opened their doors to the working class. On the other hand, there was so much that tested her traditional upbringing. The way the Bolsheviks condemned religion and old-fashioned values. There were campaigns against the family. There was divorce on demand, even legalized abortion, a law passed during her stay. But all this, the pros and cons of Bolshevik idealism, seemed secondary to a more obvious problem, the mood in the streets. People were hungry, fuel was rationed, there was talk of disease. At a very basic level, it seemed the revolution was failing to deliver. What did you expect, a Garden of Eden? Certainly more than this. I went to the ballet last night. The whole theater full of workers. It was wonderful. They loved it. They gobbled up the performance with their eyes. But their faces were pinched. The clothes all torn and dirty. And I'm sorry. I thought, what is the point in feeding their souls if you can't even feed their stomachs? You must believe we would like to. Like to? I'm not denying the suffering, Claire, but it's not so easy. 
You seem to forget that Bolshevik Russia is at war. The Bolsheviks had faced opposition from the start. Lenin had pulled Russia out of the First World War. Many Russians had found this shameful. Joining up with those that still supported the Tsar, they'd formed anti-Bolshevik armies, the Whites. And Russia had split in civil war. At first, the Reds, the Bolsheviks, controlled just a smallish area of central Russia. But under Trotsky, the commissar for war, the Red Army had grown in size and beaten the Whites back. We barely survived at all. The British and French armed the Whites, blockaded our borders. All the food we have must go to the army, that's only reasonable. And as for fuel, well, there's no way to bring it to Moscow. Every man that can be spared to fight is fighting. What did you expect? That war and blockade wouldn't hurt? The war seemed believable as an excuse for Moscow's problems, but it didn't satisfy everyone. One such was a man Claire met at a rally in Red Square. Trotsky was there, addressing some troops. He asked me, do you know why the guards keep us so far from Trotsky? Because any number of men and women in this crowd would love him dead. This show of love for Trotsky, it's all theater, he said. He was speaking French, but even so I was frightened for him to talk like that in public. He said, when you've lived so close to death for so long, you stop caring. He took me by the arm, said he had things to tell me. In her diary, Claire doesn't record exactly what this man, Victor, told her. Perhaps she was frightened the diary might fall into the wrong hands. All she says is that Victor gave her the other side of the story. Perhaps he explained how, for many, the Bolsheviks had betrayed the dream of revolution. In 1917, there'd been such hope. Prisoners released from jail, the death sentence abolished, the Tsar's secret police disbanded. Elections were held. For the first time in Russia, real democracy, the rule of the people seemed possible. But when the votes for the new assembly were counted in January 1918, the Bolsheviks were shown up as the minority party they'd always been. Lenin closed the assembly down after only one day. As he put it, we will completely and publicly destroy democracy in the name of the revolutionary dictatorship. It will be a good lesson. Press censorship came back. The death penalty came back. We wondered what we'd fought for. All opposition banned. The state is an instrument of terror. That's what Lenin said. And within weeks of coming to power, they set up the Cheka. The security police. To give it its full name, the Extraordinary Commission for the Struggle Against Counter-Revolution and Sabotage. Run by a certain Felix Zierjinsky. Have you heard of Zierjinsky? I've heard of Zierjinsky. Under Zierjinsky, the Cheka had become Lenin's weapon against the enemies of the revolution. They killed at least 50,000 people in the Civil War years. They became known as the Red Terror. In fact, Claire had met Siajinsky just a few days beforehand. Kamenev had at last arranged for her to sculpt the leading Bolsheviks. First had come Zinoviev, a leading light in the Comintern, the international communist movement. 
Zierjinsky had come next. At the time, I didn't really know how important he was. He was quiet as a monk, his eyes so sad. I said, you're an angel to sit so still. He said, you learn patience in prison. Before the revolution, he spent 11 years in Tsarist jails. It taught him how to hate. Under Lenin, Bolshevik Russia had become a one-party state. Like the Tsars, he ruled by decree. In 1919, he declared that to win the war, the state had to take control of everything it needed. Those at all well off found their property seized on the orders of the Bolsheviks. Claire found herself the proud owner of a fur coat about which she didn't ask too many questions. But those that suffered most were those that had least to give, the peasants in the countryside. It was all an enormous confidence trick. Lenin knew he had no chance of power without the peasants, so he promised them land. And Marx taught him that all private ownership is theft, but he gives land to the peasants. Makes no sense! It was just a matter of time before the Bolsheviks took it back. Of course, the war disrupts the food supply, the cities grow hungry. So Trotsky, commissar for war, says, fine. We've beaten the whites. Now we'll use my Red Army to beat the peasants. What little grain they have, we'll take from them at the point of a bayonet. The effects of Bolshevism, war, and bad harvests in the countryside were devastating. From late 1920, famine hit the Volga Basin. Perhaps five million people lost their lives. In this dark time, the country at breaking point, the revolution one step from collapse. Claire's main concern was less the pros or cons of Bolshevism, but whether, as promised, she'd ever meet Lenin or Trotsky. She always said afterwards. I went to Moscow because some portrait work was offered me. Politics was not my affair. At last she got her wish. On October 19, 1920, Claire Sheridan met Trotsky and sculpted his image. Trotsky was charming. She describes him flirting with her, kissing her clay-covered hands. They got on like a house on fire. Meanwhile, his troops put down peasant rebellions. More deaths, more suffering. But the high point of her visit came with the call to sculpt Lenin himself. Kamenev said, it's all arranged. Lenin will receive you from 11 until 4 tomorrow. He said, do the best work you've ever done. You'll be face to face with history. The strange thing is, on meeting him, how he looked so ordinary. Very unheroic in his spotted blue suit and his short legs. Actually, he looked very ill. Unlike Trotsky, Lenin was more reserved. Claire and he talked about the war, about Churchill, about art, and how it disguises hard reality. But Lenin was preoccupied. 
working for hours at a stretch without food, without even a cup of tea. What Claire didn't know, what no one knew at that time, was that in these months, Lenin was preparing to rein back the revolution. Right from the start, it was Lenin that had driven the Bolsheviks forward. Some Bolsheviks, Kamenev included, believed Lenin had wanted too much, too soon, that a worker's state was not possible in a country with so little industry, the workers so outnumbered by peasants on the land. Lenin's impatience had created a tyranny, the workers in the cities against the rest. And that tyranny had brought the country to the point of ruin. In 1921, Lenin declared a tactical retreat. Food requisitions were abolished. Some free trade allowed once more. For the die-hard Bolsheviks, this new economic policy, the return of private trade to Russia, was a bitter pill to swallow. With the country so obviously against them, they developed a kind of siege mentality, which later, in more ruthless hands, would lead to even greater horror. Claire, meanwhile, had returned to London, bringing back her trophies to the old world, as she called it, of tips and restaurants and civilization. The London Times ran her story for a week, but London society snubbed her as a traitor to her class. Any room I entered, the whisper became a loud buzz. Bolshevik. Whole drawing rooms emptied. Friends turned their backs. I felt it wasn't up to me to justify these bloody Bolsheviks. I knew I'd not fully understood the condition of things in Russia. But faced with such ignorant nonsense, time and time again, I found myself coming to their defense until it reached a point. Commissions for new work entirely dried up, and I was forced to leave London for America. It seemed they simply could not forgive me. <laughs> 